expanding your kingdom influence. Ask your neighbor, are you influential? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't ask, are you an influencer? You know that sometimes that can be very different. Huh? Nowadays, influencer is a, is a, is a profession. Are you influencer? Because you're here to have kingdom influence. God wants you to have influence. God wants you to impact the lives of people. God wants you to have fruit. And fruit comes from influence. Somehow, the body of Christ today, we seem to think that if we are humble, we should never desire or even confess to want to be great. We, we feel like it's humility. Like, I don't, I don't want big things for myself. I don't want to be great. Maybe it's because we've, dis, we've been taught that desiring greatness for yourself is carnal or sinful. We've been taught as Christians, you're supposed to be humble. Any humble Christians in the house? You know humble Christians? Somebody tells you, well done, you just say, Yesu. Humble. Bless the Lord. Humble. There's some Christians, but they don't even know how to say thank you. They just say, bless the Lord. It's Jesus. <laughs> it's God. <laughs> oh, glory. I mean, by the way, there's nothing wrong with giving glory to God. Don't get me wrong. But seriously, there's a word called thank you. There's something you did that someone is commending you. Yeah. We've been taught that it's wrong to actually be praised or it's wrong to receive reward, to receive acc accolades. As to us Christians, we don't want them. It's almost like, no, no, don't even mention. And it's like, I want you to aspire for greatness, but I want you to redefine greatness. Because greatness in my kingdom is defined in a different way. You know, the problem comes when we want to become better or the greatest in order to lord it over others. Rather than becoming a servant to help people. Yeah. I want people in this church to aspire to be millionaires. Yeah. But you need to understand... The world is all aspiring to be millionaires. So what's the difference between you and the guy in the world? It's because you want to do it so that you can serve humanity. You want to do it so that you can be a blessing to humanity. Yeah. And if you're not a blessing to humanity now, Sembuse, when you have a million dollars. Oh, sorry, Sembuse. How about... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what, what, yeah, when you have a million dollars, what's going to make a difference then? So aspire for it, but it should be showing now. Your greatness starts now when you're still young. It starts with your attitude. It starts with how you're using your resources. Aspire for greatness. The world wants greatness to dominate others, but for a Christian, we want greatness to bring people to God and help them to become the best that they were created to be. Aspire for it. Aspire for it. All these other things will be added to you, but they shall not define you. Yeah. Money. By the way, if God blesses you with money and you've not understood and your definition of greatness is a world's definition, you will backslide. And backslide might not mean that you stand there and you say, I no longer want to talk the name of Jesus. No. It just might mean that you can't even come to a gathering like this. Because you know busy people like us. Yeah, you might backslide. And so my prayer for you is God will not trust you with more resources than your understanding. Yeah. Because I don't want you to backslide. Your eternal destination is the most important thing for me. So aspire for greatness. Ask God to, to give you capacity for greatness. There's a famous missionary called William Carey who said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. He's like, expect great things for God. Why? So that you can attempt great things from God. Yeah, if you're, if you're expecting great things from God so that you can attempt great things for yourself, you're in trouble. But ask God to bless you. Ask him to give you platforms. Ask him to open the doors. Ask him, he says even, ask me for nations. It's not asking for greatness. Mediocre people don't have nations. But he's saying, give me nations, Lord. Yeah, I want them. But I don't want them so that I can be on Instagram and people follow me. That's not what it's for. I want the nations so I can be a blessing. Yeah. Some of you, by the way, you're, 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 you're influencers. Yeah, people like you. You're beautiful. You show yourself on Instagram and everybody just likes and they say, oh, you look beautiful today. Yeah. <laughs> and you just say, I woke up like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, that's how the world does it. 
They want to be appreciated. Aspire for followers so that you can influence them for Jesus. Yeah. It's, a, it's all about the motive, by the way. It's all about motive. But God wants us to aspire for greatness. Just like someone in the world is aspiring for greatness, but for a different reason. Why should we expect or aspire to do great things for God? I'm going, I'll give you three reasons. Number one, it's a reason we're here. It's a reason we're here. Remember that ball of your earthly life? That ball has a purpose. And that, that purpose is time-bound. And that purpose is that you will make disciples of all nations. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Do you realize those things will not be relevant after death? You will not be able to make disciples in heaven or wherever you go because the opportunity to influence spiritually at that level will be finished. You will not be able to baptize. There's no baptism in heaven. Everyone who's there already has received what they needed. There's no teaching people to obey in heaven because everybody there has full they, they know fully as they are fully known. There's not a pla- it's not a place for learning because you will know. It, it's not a place where you'll be, you'll be there to be instructed by another person. So the only opportunity you have to, to, to influence people for the kingdom is in this tiny ball. This is it. And every day you have opportunity to influence in the season of life you're in. Some of you, by God's grace, you understood this lesson a long time ago while you are in high school. And so in high school, you influenced for the kingdom. You stored aside heavenly rewards. Then you went to college. In college, you influenced for the kingdom. You gained even more results. And then you went into your first job. In your first job, you influenced for the kingdom. Yeah. Somehow you are, you are fortunate. You are clued. Somebody taught you. Some of us are getting into the game late. Almost like the thief on the cross, but thank God, not yet. You still have a few years in this ball. <laughs> So we don't come in like the guys who came in to, from college. Some of us need to understand this. We don't have time. There's, we, need to make, we need to get these rewards that some people have been accumulating since they were born in the womb. What did one of my deacons say? By the way, where are my deacons today? Where are they? Elders. Huh? Elders, come. Come, 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 come. Deacons, come, come, come. Yeah, yeah, where are you? No wonder the church is looking so full there, and yet there's so much space here. Yeah, thank you. They are making space for you. The ones in the, front, in the back, now you can move into those spaces. Just come. Can you see the guys who came today? They're like, huh? When was the ordination? <laughs> How can I apply to be on stage? Anybody can be on stage. Come, 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 come. Yeah, come close. And then the ones who've been created space, come closer. Be part of the family. Some people are standing so far away. There's blessing in being with the family. Let's be together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. What was I saying about deacons? That made me remember that you guys are not here. <laughs> oh, the deacons who are born ready. Yeah, some of these ones were born ready. They were, they were born saved. Eh? They were born saved. So they were born saved. Amen. <laughs> but some of us were not born saved. We are starting late. So what do we do? We, we understand we don't have time. We must make our lives count. And by the way, let me just say this. There's an advantage. Sometimes I feel like the people who are born, who are, who, who are born again later, sometimes they have much more urgency. Yeah. So God has a way of evening things out. Some of those of you who got saved on your babies, you take things for granted too much. Somebody even prayed for you to survive through high school. Yeah. And that's why you have fruit. In fact, you're bearing fruit on behalf because your parents prayed for fruit in your life. It's not your prayers. But let me tell you, the guys who get saved later, there's, the ones I know, there's a kahanga. There's a desperate, they want to know God. They want people to know Jesus. Am I, anybody in the house who's like that? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're like, my life has to count for something. I have a past. Ah, I need to get rewards now. I was giving rewards for the other kingdom. Too much of that. Now I'm ready to give re- results to the ca- kingdom that actually counts. Yeah, exactly. So, so every single one of us, we need to understand, this is the reason we're here. The, the, the task, the mission, should you accept it, 
is to make disciples of all nations. That's what, that's what it is. And the scope is given in that. The scope is all nations. So in other words, making disciples is not just in your little village. Where you are now is testing. If you're in high school, you better learn to make disciples because you're preparing for a global platform. Yeah. God wants you to make disciples of all nations. And that's why he says, ask me and I will give you nations. He's not saying that you ha now you have a house in Dubai, you have a house in London, you have a house in New York. That's what he's saying. Although that's not a bad thing. But he's saying, ask God to give you sons and daughters in every nation. By the way, I long to have sons and daughters in Latin America. I do. And I don't know how. I don't know how. But I also know that a while back, in this very, on this very pulpit, I was longing to have sons and daughters who are French-speaking. And they are here. They are here. Yeah. So the same God who gave me Francophone sons and daughters can give me Arabic sons and daughters. Yeah. He can. I long for it, by the way. I long for my influence. By the way, there's a church that's now translating Mizizi into Arabic. So I know it's just come. It's about to come. It's about to happen. Yeah, I long for it. Are you longing for it yourself? Yeah, you should long for your influence. Long that you have sons and daughters everywhere because he's saying, ask me for nations. Ask me for When you see the news and you see nations falling, you should be saying, God, I want, show me how I, my disciples will influence that nation. Yeah, and maybe right now I can only start with prayer. But a time will come when you will give me sons and daughters in those places. Because all of us were created on this ball to have global influence. Uh -uh. Ask your neighbor, are you influential? Again, just ask them for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you should be aspiring for greatness. Number two, second reason. It carries great rewards. It carries great rewards. Ah, desiring to be great for the kingdom. It carries great rewards when you desire things of God. Matthew 6.33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. All the things that everybody else looks after and looks for, the things they desire, the things they aspire for, they will come to you. God will give them to you. You won't have to cry for them. They will follow you. Blessings will follow you. God tells us those things that people are seeking are just little things. Those are inputs. Yeah. Those are not outputs. Those are inputs. Having a Mercedes is an input. Yeah. If, if you need to be able to be traveling to Kitale every weekend because you have disciples, maybe the car you have may not be able to get you there quickly enough. Uh-huh. So when, the, when that Mercedes comes, it's not an, it's not an output. It's not something to boast about. It is an input for the sake of you taking the gospel to Kitale. Am I, are you, am I talking to somebody in the house today? Yes. When God gives you a big house in Runda, it's because your disciples need space. I need a living room, Lord, that can take 30 people. Yeah. How else will I be launching groups that I can send to other places? When my sons come from other countries, where will they stay? Yeah, me, I've been telling God, I like my house, but Lord, family nights, this is too small. Yeah. Yeah. So this year, family night will move to another venue. It will. Yeah. And by the way, I have a bigger house now that my kids are living. And people say, why do you have a big house and your kids are living? I say, ah, who told you these are the only children I have? In fact, my children are about to expand dramatically. So I need a house to host them. Uh, Onens, you have a house. The house is growing. Now you can come with even your disciples into the house. I'll host all of you. Yeah. Uh, they are coming. <laughs> the Uganda delegation <laughs> you can stay in the South Wing, I tell you. <laughs> Jesus' expectation. Yeah, this is, he, he said, there's rewards. God wants us to have rewards, that we, but he wants us those rewards to be as we seek his kingdom. Don't get the order wrong because some of us are saying, God, give me rewards so I can seek your kingdom. And God is saying, no, no, no. Seek the kingdom. All things will follow after you. It has great rewards when you seek God's kingdom. And I've told you this many times. I hope this sticks in your mind and makes you really disillusioned with worldly wealth. Because God's wealth brings his wealth without sorrow. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without sorrow attached to it. The blessing of the world brings sorrow with it all the time. without God, trust me, that wealth, it has attachments to it. Yeah. You will not enjoy it. You won't. Don't let people on Instagram cheat you. <laughs> There's a price. There's a price. Yeah. And the price could be your life. Jesus says, what does it 
profit a person to gain the whole world but lose their soul. The bargain is not worth it. It's not worth it. You seek the kingdom and let all other things follow after you. The third reason why you should and you must aspire for great things is that God has empowered you for it. God has actually given you the capacity for it. It's interesting, John 14, 12 says, Jesus told his disciples, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. Yeah, you've already been given the capacity to do greater things than Jesus. And he says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You know, there's some people who just think and God does. They just desire and it happens. Yeah. 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 There are people who are like that. It's like, God, I, I've not even finished the sentence. You've already given me the solution. But it's because of their alignment. It's because they're aligned. God has empowered you. For, and and Jesus' expectation is that we will do greater things than he did. Like, I think, how is that? How is that a real thing? How is it that Jesus who fed 5,000 expects me to feed like with the little fish, bread and fish. Like how, does, how, how, how am I supposed to raise the dead? How, how am I supposed to get blind people to see and, 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 and lepers to be healed? How am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to have wisdom for every criticism that comes my way? How am I supposed to live like that? Jesus, are you serious? Did you actually expect that of me? But imagine he does. He's built me with a capacity to do greater things than Jesus. So my aspiration is that Jesus is my basic launch pad. Like, I want my life to achieve far greater things than Jesus ever did. Because he himself has said it. So if Jesus fed 5,000, I want to feed 10,000 at least. Yeah. And I don't mean spiritually. Because <laughs> it wasn't spiritually. No. He fed. There's a, there's, a, there's a Muslim guy in Mombasa who owns a, a big company, a big factory. And he feeds all the poor people in town. Anybody from Mombasa who can verify that my stories are true? And how many, how, how many days in the week does he do it? Every Friday. Actually, it's every day. That's what I thought. Every day. Anybody who is poor, come and eat lunch. And he has a public park where he serves. I... How is that? That I've never heard of a believer doing that. Yeah? How come? It's because we've not been taught to aspire for great things. Believers are aspiring for big mansions where they can put their cars in and hide their children inside. Yeah, we've not understood the purpose of this wealth. So that we can die and have a big funeral. What is, how is that helpful to you? Aspire. Tell God, I want to feed 5,000. I want to feed 10, I want to feed all the poor in Nairobi. What would it take for you to feed them every day? And then say, God, that's what I need. That's the basic, that's the basic level of the wealth I, I require in my life, Lord. But of course, now you have to start feeding a few. <laughs> As you ask him to trust you with money to feed all of Nairobi, right now, what are you doing with the little money he's given you? Who are you feeding with it? That's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'm actually asking, who are you feeding with that money? Yeah? Yeah, aspire for it. He's given you the capacity. I believe believers should be asking for these things. Lord, I need to be a multimillionaire. Why? Because the needs in Nairobi are huge. The needs in Kampala are huge. The needs in Bujumbura are huge. Some Christians have to be seen to step up and to own businesses that can actually bring solutions into these cities. Yeah. But start with the little part. Because he who is faithful with little will be entrusted with much. Yeah, start now. Aspiring for greatness. And listen, we rule the earth on God's behalf by changing people's lives. That's how you're going to change people's. That's how you're going to change the world. You know, I used to talk a lot about the seven mountains. Uh, the six sectors of society. We call them at Mavuno. And I still think about them greatly. But I think my thinking has shifted slightly, ever so slightly. Because I used to think that the solution to the mountains, the sectors of society, is through uh, getting people to legislate, 
putting people in offices of influence, getting people to have places where they can make big decisions for the sake of the world. I still think that, but I think that is not the goal. That is the outcome. What I really should be doing is changing people's lives because if I change enough people's lives in that industry, those things will happen naturally. Yeah. I think sometimes Christians, we come out of our, we come out of our calling because now we're trying to do things the way the world does them. Let's get 10 people here into political office. Let's make sure we give them legislation that can change this area. Let's make sure that, 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 they're the, that they we're the ones who are ruling and we're the ones who have political power. That's a very dangerous game to play. And if you don't think so, watch the American political scene. Because that's what the church gets swept up and becomes nothing more than just a political bandwagon that any politician who's smart enough can take advantage of. But anyway, why go to America? Come closer home. That's what happened in our nation. It's happening even now. Yeah. That the church has no critique because it enters a political bandwagon. We've bought hook, line, and sinker. That so long as a politician says the right words in our churches and makes the right actions, he must be God's appointed for our nation. And we don't have critical thinking in the church about political issues. And the reason is when you now begin to make politics your goal or business domination your goal, those things will easily become idols for the church. So what should Christians be doing? What if we disciple the whole of parliament? Or at least 20%. I think we change the nation. Yeah, without taking power. Just by discipleship. What if you could disciple, what's one of our corrupt um, institutions? Which one? Lands, Ministry of Lands. <laughs> Is that the one you all say? <laughs> What, what, if, what, if you could, what if we could disciple, like, the junior officers in the Ministry of Lands? What if we could disciple the police station next to our church and disciple, like, 30% of the police officers in that police station? You don't think something's going to shift dramatically? It will. Yeah. So I feel like we sometimes put the cart before the horse. We go for the policy, we go for the legislation, and we forget that you can never legislate people's hearts. Yeah, you can't. The only thing that will change the society is transformed minds. When people are transformed by the renewal of their minds through the gospel, then they start thinking differently and you change that corporation. You change that institution. You change that sector of society. We rule the earth on God's behalf by changing people's lives. Yeah, it's that simple. So when God says, ask of me and I'll give you nations, he's saying, ask me for people. Ask me for disciples in those nations. Ask me for people whose minds you've changed because they've become like you as you've become like me. That's, that's, that's the biggest shift. I think I'm still going for the same goal, but I think I've understood I was going at it by going for the outcome as opposed to going for the thing that I can affect. Yeah, the outcome will come. But if you chase the outcome, you'll not get it. You have to chase the, the, the most important thing, which is the lives of the people who change the society. We change their lives and we change the society. And in God's kingdom, influence is measured by how many people you disciple. That's what, that's what happens. In the kingdom of God, greatness will be about how many people you serve, how many people you disciple, how many people you reproduce yourself in and invite to follow you as you follow Christ. Whatever you're gifting, and all of us are gifted differently, like we said, whatever your office, whatever your, your, your set of spiritual gifts, whether it's apostolic, some gifts are apostolic, some of you are very apostolic, you're starters, you're the entrepreneurs. You're always thinking big ideas. How do we go into new places? How do we change uh, this thing? That's an apostolic mindset. Some of you are prophetic. You're seers. You're thinkers. You're discerners. You're prayerers. You're, you're, you're always uh, able to reflect deeply. Your gifts are those kinds. They're, they're very introspective gifts. Some of you are evangelistic. You're the ones who are just always like, wow, you're the life of the party. And people like you and you're attractive and you can attract people to your, whatever message you have. Some of you are teachers. 
you're really just, every time you hear ideas, your mind is always breaking down those ideas to think of how to pass them on to others. And you're good at putting down ideas. You're writers. You're disseminators of information. That's where you lean. Others of you, you're much more uh, um, pastoral. You care for people. You ask them deep questions. You love to pray for people. People come to you when they're in trouble. Have I, that's, that's like covers most, all, 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 all the gifts fall within those five. But you know, it doesn't matter what kind of person you are. Every single one of us is called to aspire for influence. Yeah. Yeah. We might influence differently, but we can all influence. And God wants us to influence. And in the kingdom, people are not promoted by your level of gifting, but by your level of faithfulness with God's mission. Yeah. It's not the most gifted who get rewarded. It's the, it's the most faithful. The ones who are faithful with God's mission. Because when you're faithful, you become fruitful. That's the purpose of faithfulness. So I, I wanted to give you that big picture just to say every single one of us was created to influence. And why I told you about the different sets of gifts is because some of you are more shy than others. But that's okay. Your shyness is not a disadvantage. In fact, it makes you a person who is able to have a longer conversation with someone than that sanguine who's like, hey, I love all of you. <laughs> What's your name, by the way? I still love you. <laughs> they have different gifts from yours. So don't look down on your gift. You may be a one-to-one -one person and they might be a 10,000 to one person, but you have your gift that they don't have. Yeah, all of us are called to be disciple makers. And all of us will change the world through making disciples. If you come to your high school and you're the greatest prefect they ever had and you bring about rules to stop people from doing drugs and it's exciting and then you graduate, I can tell you, your school will go back to what it was. It will. But if you disciple some people in your high school and you disciple the next generation of prefects and you teach them how to disciple the next generation of prefects, your school will forever be different. Yeah. There's, there's a school... A rival school when I was in high school. They weren't good for much, but one thing they were good for. <laughs> They're called Lenana School. <laughs> hey, don't walk out of the church. <laughs> I, might lose, I might lose congregation members. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing I admire about that school. There was a, a chaplain. He was a white man. He's uh, from England. His name was Reverend Dodman. And he was a chaplain, but he understood discipleship. So every year, he would get a group of boys, and he'd walk with them, and share his life with them, and teach them to follow Jesus. And when they graduated, he'd take another group of boys and do the same. And years later, when I began to reflect, I realized the legacy of that school is many, many godly leaders like many of the institutions, Christian institutions in this country were led by people from another school. And it's because of one guy, one man, who created a culture of discipleship. Now me, I went to a great school that had great people. <laughs> but you know, because there was no discipleship, we became great thugs. Yeah. By the way, many of the scandalous guys, I can name names, who have done some serious, crazy things in this country. They are from my school. Because nobody discipled us. So we were great. By the way, I think we're even greater than those guys. But because nobody discipled our greatness, we've not become nation changers the way the people from... And that's a rare admission. I don't even know if this is on camera. This can be used against me, and I suspect it will be used against me. <laughs> but I need to say the truth. The power of one discipler, one teacher in a high school, changing a nation. Yeah, some of you are teachers. And you've looked down on yourself, not understanding the powerful platform that God has given you that could change nations. Yeah. Any teachers in the house? Yeah, you're here. You're here. And there are many of you. You have such a powerful platform to make disciples and to actually change nations as a result. As it's, it's, it's so interesting. You can think of, I can think of many, many stories like those of places, of people who are just, somebody just became a disciple. And out of that discipleship, an industry changed. A nation changed. There was a difference. The, the, they say that um, England did not go through what France went through. 
And if you're from a Francophone country, you can probably tell the massive difference in the English civilization versus the French civilization. Yeah. The French killed their king, killed their church leaders, established a secular republic. And if you go to a Francophone country that was colonized by France, you will see the difference. Yeah. The, the coups everywhere. But even apart from the coups, just the culture, it's so different. Like, I look at the resources the church has in the English-speaking world, and I look at the Francophone world, it's almost starved of resources, commentaries, Bible dictionary. It's like all the, dic- all the stuff is being translated from the English world to the French world. And yet the church was planted in those countries at the same time. Yeah? But you know what made the difference? It was a man called John Wesley. And this man began a movement of discipleship back in England. And he built little groups. He used to call them classes. Small groups of people. And he'd get them to disciple and then he taught them to disciple others. And they created something in England that later on, there's an era in England called the Victorian era. When Queen Victoria ruled. And you'll always hear people talk about Victorian morals. It's like people who are so straight-laced. They dressed formally. They didn't do revealing things. They were not into flesh things. England became a moral nation because of a man called John Wesley. And others like him. The people he discipled. One man. And as a result, they didn't kill their king. They didn't kill their church. They continued as a moral nation. And even though they were colonized, are just as bad. Because, I mean, there's no nation that is a a righteous nation. But they had a very different motive and a different way of thinking from those who colonized in the French world. One man changed the nation, making disciples. Are you understanding something powerful right now? That you could be missing the biggest opportunity of your life where God has placed you. Because in every situation you're in right now, you have an opportunity to make disciples in that place. Maybe you're jobless. Maybe you're complaining and wishing for the day that your life will stop, will will get a job and then everything will improve. And you don't understand, right now there are some young men in the estate who have nothing to do, they have finished school and someone like you, they would listen to. And maybe this is the opportunity, God has just been given you an opportunity to earn some eternal rewards and to disciple somebody for him. And you're not understanding, my goodness, I could actually have the greatest opportunity right now, even as I'm waiting for God to change my circumstances. That God has given us that opportunity. So at Mavuno Church, we want to equip you. We want to teach you the most important skill you can ever have in life. The skill of making disciples. We want to make sure that there's no single person in this church who doesn't understand the capacity they have to change nations, to change workplaces. Our prayer is that everywhere you go, you will leave a call of disciples. And by the way, when you're done in that job, my prayer is that the Lord will not promote you until you've finished your work in that place. But when you finish, the Lord promotes you to the next level and he promotes you so that you can finish discipling there and you move. And you're able to say, it is finished. Yeah, I've been here for three years in this role. It is finished. What I'm, I'm rejoicing is not that I've gotten a new pay rise. Or I'm moving to a new organization that's more prestigious. I'm rejoicing because in my station, it is finished. I've done what I came to do here. Yeah. I'm looking at one of my daughters, Lena, from Uganda. Lena is, she, 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 Aline, sorry. Sorry, I'm baptizing you. Lena is a Scottish version. <laughs> she's from Scotland. She's, she lives in, 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 in Kampala. And she's part of Mavuno Kampala. I mean, she's a foreigner, you guys. She should be doing her own thing. But right now she's planting a church with Ugandans in the church. And she's reaching street kids and people in the slum and starting a church. By the way, do they speak English or are they speaking? So it's a Lugan. It's like, yeah. So it's not, it's not even the language she speaks, but she's doing it. A single woman in another country. And she knows that this is her mission, her assignment in this season. And when she's finished, she'll be able to say, I've done what I came to Uganda to do. And now she's ready to be promoted to the next level. That's fruitfulness, people. Yeah, and I can give many other stories of people in this room who are exactly the same. In the situation, God has put them there. God has put them in a foreign nation. God has put them in a different place. But in that place, they're being faithful to raise disciples. 
And in Mavuno, we want to give you the skills so that wherever you land, when you get your visa and go to Harvard, Hey, there are many who want to go to Harvard in this church. <laughs> Harvard is in trouble. If all of you get those visas. Yeah, but you won't go there so that you can have a title that say, and then uh, quotes Harvard, huh? LLB, Harvard. That's not where you're going there. Yeah, it's a nice thing. But you'll be there because in the three, four years you're in that school, you are going to make a difference. Yeah, and you will leave some disciples in that place. People whose lives will never be the same, who are following Jesus. Maybe you might even leave a church planted in that campus. Yeah. And then you can say it is finished. Now let me go and take this nice degree and use it to get a job and do the same wherever God sends me. We want to give you the skills for that. We want to give you the skills so whether you're a housewife, whether you're a CEO, whoever you are, you know how to make disciples in the opportunity God gives you wherever you are. So how do we train you? I want to give you the leadership pathway for increasing your influence. The leadership pathway we give you in Mavuno to increase your growth, influence, your influence as a kingdom leader. And if you could just put that diagram up, that's a diagram there. That's a diagram. <laughs> Little titles you already know. But now I'm hoping I'm giving you a bigger kingdom picture for what these titles mean. The little center there is DG, stands for Discipleship Group. The next one is MC, stands for Missional Community. The next one is a zone, a compass, a network, a movement, an association of movements. Maybe just, yeah, I guess, I guess it's important to just point out and say that each of these is a new zone of influence. Each of these is a greater zone of influence. And I'm going to look at the first three, um, the ones that are in yellow. But for me, I just want to look at them as an example. Because what are you doing in each of these? You're learning how to scale your influence, to influence more people. If you're saying, God, I want to influence 10,000 people, Jesus influenced 5,000, then you need to understand that the level of 5,000 is not at the DG level. There's another level you move to to influence that many. But I want you to understand, starting from the basic, how do I start to be an influencer wherever I am? So that's a diagram. We'll come back to it. But let's start with discipleship group. DG. We call it DG in Mavuno. If you hear people talk about DG, discipleship group. And by the way, you guys, be defining things. Don't start having insider church language. If you want to join a DG in our church, what's a DG? It's a discipleship group. Yeah, DG is for you guys. It's, an ins it's insider language. If you want to join a discipleship group, a, a discipleship group is a group of 3 to 15 members who meet weekly to grow as disciples of Jesus. That's what a, discipleship, a, a DG or a discipleship group is. The discipleship group is the core family unit of Mavuno Church. And it's extremely important because just like a healthy family is the main building block to a healthy nation, a healthy DG is the, it's the effective building block to a healthy movement of any kind. By the way, because we, we sent out people back in the day, let me just take a pause and say, before, because before back in the day, we sent out people to start frontline initiatives without this knowledge. They got eaten up alive. They started good organizations, many of them, that became secular NGOs or as good as secular NGOs. Because if you don't have the building block of discipleship in the institution or the thing you're starting as a kingdom uh, servant, whether it's a business, whether it is your, your NGO, whatever it is, then that thing will be changed. The, 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 the tendency is for you to become secularized because the pressure of the world is towards secularization. So the DG is that building block for any kingdom movement, any kingdom initiative. It's led by a DG leader, a discipleship group leader, and it's how you start a core unit that will change, that will change the world with you. Your main disciples, this is who they are. And it's how you start a church, by the way. If you're starting a church in this season in Mavuno's life, we don't ask you go hire a hall, get a PA system, get green chairs, <laughs> and, and then start a, start a Mavuno church. And, and what else? Paint the wall black. There's like a thing all Mavuno churches do. Hire tent. <laughs> no, that's not how you start a church. Start a discipleship group. Start a core team of disciples. And this is how you can impact your office. This is how you impact or create change in an industry, a school, a sector of society. What's the purpose of a DG? What's the purpose of a discipleship group? The primary purpose is discipleship. Is discipleship. 
how to help every member to grow to maturity as a follower of Jesus. That's the primary purpose of a DG. And you're going to see that each of these others have a different purpose. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's what DGs do, is they help everybody become mature. They help everybody to grow in understanding who Jesus is. Colossians 1.28, he's the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. So that's what we do. We want to make sure everybody is mature. If you're a DG leader, that's actually your mission, is to help everybody in your DG to become mature and mature in Christ, mature in their faith. That's what you do. What if you're not mature yourself? That's okay, because none of us has arrived. It's a journey that I'm walking as others are helping me walk it. So I'm following someone who's also following someone, isn't it? And other people are following me as I walk. So if I don't, if I have an answer, then I turn to my disciple and ask them, I've been asked this question, and they tell me the answer, and then I look back and I say, hey guys, here's what the answer is. Here's what we're I'm also learning. So it's not about I'm perfect, so let me help you guys become perfect. It's more of, hey, we're all walking the same direction. Let me help you as you follow me to become everything God wants you to be. This is what a discipleship group does. Now, what are the functions of a discipleship group? I'm giving some definitions here. Discipleship groups carry out discipleship by forming a loving family. Form a loving family. That's the first thing you do when you want to change your institution, when you want to change your estate, when you want to change a group of people's lives. And that group, that family should provide support by sharing celebrations, sharing burdens, sharing challenges through prayer, presence, and active support. The core essence of a discipleship group, it's not a Bible study. It's a place where we support each other. It's a place where everybody gets family. It's a place where nobody is anonymous. It's a place where everybody belongs. So that's the first thing, is support. Number two is nurture. Ensuring members are growing through spiritual disciplines. So as a discipleship group leader, this is what you do. You teach people disciplines, and then you hold them accountable to grow in those disciplines. So Bible reading, prayer, fasting, church attendance, discipleship group attendance, giving. These are all rhythms of the Christian life. And you're helping your people get into that habit. I've noticed that people who got saved more recently, sometimes struggle with the habit of attending church every weekend. Because that's not how they've grown up. Now, some of us who grew up in Christian homes, they thought, by the way, even when I'm on leave and I'm, I, I've decided I'm sleeping in on a Sunday, I, have, I just feel like something is eating me. Anybody, like any church kids... It's like you are so, so disciple to go to church on Sunday. It's like, what am I doing asleep and people are praising the Lord in the house of the Lord? Somebody taught us. And as a discipleship group leader, that's what you're here to teach your people. New habits. Reforming their minds. Sunday is the day we go and worship the Lord. And some people, I mean, a lot of people, because they're not discipled, have become these, today I feel like going to church. Today I feel like going to another church. That's actually not, it's actually just lack of discipleship. They have not understood that this is not how Christians operate. So as a discipleship group leader, you're the one who's helping them. And you're asking, guys, I mean, I didn't see you in church. What's happening? How do we make sure that everybody comes? Some people were not taught how to tithe. They just, it was just not a thing. Nobody ever taught them. And in your discipleship group, you need to understand, I'm the one who helps people learn how to tithe. I'm the one who actually asks people, uh-huh. Was it Pastor who was telling us that the discipler would ask you, show me your tithe records. Show me the, the M-Pesa that shows you sent your parents an honor gift this month. That's a disciple's work. You just tell guys, by the way, next week, everyone is showing the M-Pesa of the, that they sent their gift that Pastor M told us to the parents. Yeah, that's a disciple. 4.30 in the morning. When you wake up and you're at that prayer meeting, don't even worry about who else in campus. Your job as a DG leader is not even just to be so happy and to put uh, downtown campus representing uh, flag, flag, flag. No, that's not even the, the purpose. Your job as a DG leader, in fact, you're doing that so that you're modeling for your DG members what you want them to do. And then now you look to see, are they there? And then you call them if they're not. By the way, when I go into a, meet, a prayer meeting, uh, and it's a whole Mavuno prayer meeting, I don't really look for the rest of you. 
If you miss, I won't even notice. But if Pastor Milton misses, uh, Pastor Mills, I haven't seen you in prayer. What's happening? He's the one I'll call because he's my disciple. I'm actively making sure that prayer is a, is, a, is a rhythm in his life. I want to make sure that happens. Even the prayers for? Yeah, even the prayers here in the morning. When I come in the morning, I know I high five all of you, but I'm not looking for you. I'm looking for these ones. Uh -huh, Pastor said you're there on time. Three o'clock. When she said three o'clock, I said, hey, shh, my daughter, come on. Hey. Hey, three o'clock. Even me, I've never been to Hill City at three o'clock to pray. <laughs> my disciples, come on. I'm so proud. So that's what you do, is you make sure your disciples are there. And your job is to bring them along with you. Fasting, 21 days. Somebody tells you, me, I've never done 21 day fast, I'll die. It's your job to make sure. Let's watch a video together. Aha. Uh -huh. Let me tell you, you're not going to die. In fact, we're we are going to be your support group and cheer you. And if you feel like, like, like dying, call us. We're your group. We're your AA group. Just call us. We'll support you. You'll finish this fast. Yeah, it's your job to make sure everybody in your group actually does it. Because you know it will help them grow. So that's what a DG does. It helps nurture people. And then number four, number three, closely related, ensuring members are growing in kingdom service and responsibility. Are you serving in a ministry? Are you growing? How are you serving God at work? Yeah. So whenever we're discussing, those are the discussions we have. That's good. But as a DG leader, you know you're responsible for the lives of these people to help them become disciples of Jesus as you're becoming. Now, how are DGs formed? How are discipleship groups formed? There's four primary ways. One is through Sunday pulpit invites. Uh, you find that the pastor will say, anybody who has not been in a DG, like we did in the gathering uh, the first day, and people signed up, and we allocate a group to them. Number two is also sign-ups during one of our experiences. When you do Mizizi and you graduate, usually we'll try and make sure everybody joins a DG. When you do Ndoa, that's another thing we try and do. Number three is through DG members inviting others. I like number three. It's more organic. It's through discipleship group members inviting others in their estate, inviting their family members to the discipleship group. Listen, the DG was never meant to be a nice club. It's not the place where we meet to look at each other and be happy that we've been together for 10 years and no one else has ever joined us. That's, not, that's stagnation. A DG is meant to be actively celebrating growth. If you're not growing, you're dying. So this is when you're actually even saying, who are we praying to bring? As a leader, you're asking guys, who are we praying to bring? We must be growing and ensuring that we're growing so that we can multiply. And so that's the second one. And by the way, there's some, there's some serious DGs in Mavuno that have really multiplied. Which, which one? At his soul ties. Uh -huh. Flood tide in Kampala. How many are there now? Se seven. One DG has multiplied into seven groups. Uh -uh. Nobody can beat that one, by the way. Even the other pastors have kept quiet. They have stopped shouting the names of the... <laughs> Everybody's like sour. Seven. <laughs> yeah, I thought Lifeway would win this one, but clearly Kampala, Kampala has got, he's got this thing under lock. Yeah, that is, that is a flood side right there. They've just covered all of us. It's so amazing because that's how it's supposed to be. And I think when the discipleship group members understand their job, guess what's happened? By the time you're seven... It means that the original seven members are now all leading their own DGs. That means there's growth. Everybody's growing. And that's, a, that's one of the most fun ways for a discipleship group to grow. And then a fourth one, which I think is even more radical, is through missionary leaders reaching a group of people and starting a new DG. So somebody comes and tells a DG leader, I want you guys to send me out because I've seen some people in my estate who need to be in a DG. So you guys commission me. I'll be a missionary and go and start a new DG. Come on, somebody. Any DG that has been formed like that? I'm just hearing, yeah, but nobody's telling me which one. Which one? Zimmerman DG was formed like that. Huh? Well done. I like it. Yeah, so there's, there's one from Lifeway like that. Is that Lifeway? Okay. Which one? Chama. And it was started as a missionary DG. During morning prayers. Uh -huh. Tell us, our deacon, our elder. Thank you. Thank you so much. So during one of the morning, for 30 morning prayers, uh, one of our members was, we realized that they had lost their child. And they were in Canada at the time. Uh, they are second born. And uh, when Pastor Muredi, I don't see my papa here. 
But when, uh, sorry, James, when he announced, <laughs> I'm sorry, they're both my papas. Uh, when he announced, I, uh, we reached out, and uh, thanks to our, um, our leaders, our DG overall for my zone, we reached out, and I remember Pastor Zilani, a group came, we went to see her. Um, the rest is history because that's, that has become a DG. We are called, yes, and actually Chama is the late, uh, a chalk, it's a late child's uh, name. Yeah. Chama means, um, for those who don't speak Swahili, it's uh, a miracle. So that boy was, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so we co-host. It's so much fun. So sometimes I co-host. I'm on the other side of Siokimau, airport people. And uh, so we've been co-hosting. It's been so much fun. Uh, we are even seeing people starting, um, like um, people are just volunteering. Uh, some, of course, are not available every week, but uh, it's been so much fun. I, I, yeah, we thank God. Yeah, Yay. Sante. And uh, please, well, I still have the mic. One of our members, um, one of our members, she's not here, she's in Kigali. Uh, one, Nora, it's the same thing. Nora has been coming. We're actually grooming her to be a leader. I saw her leadership skill from day one. But um, because she works for a medical company in the US, she, you know, her schedule can be crazy because she's working physically here in Kenya online. But guess what? She, um, she, God gave her, she, she's very new in Mavuno, like very new. And uh, she's supposed to host, but the husband has been a bit, uh, so when they did, I, I pushed her to do, it's called what? The one, Leah, Leah the one for kids, uh, parenting. So when she did it, uh, the husband that day when they were baptizing, baptizing the, the, the children, because she has two kids, um, he came. And now, I believe as much as she's in Rwanda for work in absentia, we know this year she's starting a DG in her house. It's right. It's, um, it's right behind uh, Signature Mall. When you got, yeah. So we thank God. And she has paid, she's paying for seven people. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I promise. I behave myself. She's promised, um, you know, God gave her a promotion. Uh, this I think we need to talk about. God gave her a promotion within six months of Mavuno. She was promoted, got a new job, and guess what? She has paid for, she's, I forget the number, she's paying for seven people to attend the Fearless of 2024. And she paid in 2023. Wow. So we thank God, this is a testimony. <laughs> oh my goodness. Public speaking rule number one, never give your microphone. Let them have another one. <laughs> wow. Missionary discipleship groups. So yeah, so your group, Zimmerman, you said, is one. That's yours. Come on. So you bust trailblazers from Zimmerman. Praise God. Yeah, I love it. And if you heard of Chama, basically what that was, was a group that a child passed away. And what did they do? They went to condole the family. And out of the condoling, a group was born in that house. And members moved and helped to start that group. So your group can actually have a visionary, a missionary idea of maybe if anybody in our group is going to be to go out for further studies, anybody relocates to another country or to another town, our group can actually say, we want to pray and send you and commission you to plant in the place we're going. So that's how DGs grow. And how, <laughs> you know, one thing I like about my wife, by the way, everything I teach, she applies it in the businesses she leads. God has just given her insight that not, this stuff I'm giving is actually not just spiritual. Some of you are already in that spiritual mode of church. You're not understanding. I'm teaching you how to grow kingdom influence. Yeah. This is how you start company, how your company spreads to another country. Yeah. By sending disciples, not by sending employees. Yeah. All right. Some of you are going to say this is what changed your life in this gathering. Job description of a DG leader. Job description of a discipleship group leader. If you're the leader, this is what you do. You disciple the members of the DG. As we said, you hold them accountable to weekly meetings, ensuring they're growing, ensuring they're growing in their generosity. If I'm a DG leader, I want to make sure, are you guys giving fast fruit? Who is giving? Who has a fast fruit testimony for the ones who are scared? Who is not giving? Why aren't you giving? 
if you can't give a full fast fruit this year, can you try and give a partial one? We see what God does with it. I, it's your job as a digital leader to make sure your people are growing. Of course, it also means you need to be giving your fast fruit, right? You can't lead people where you're not willing to go. So you disciple the members of your DG. Number two, plan for visits to group members and by the group to each other. It's interesting that I find when people go and see you where you are, something changes. It moves from just being a nice church thing and it becomes life. So planning, maybe even as a DG you can plan, hey, let's go visit each other's homes. Maybe we can even have a season when we just rotate and do it in each other's homes. I know DGs that have said uh, in the holidays we'll be going to visit each other's parents uh, during the holiday month. Yeah, it really builds uh, life when you start to do that. Uh, ensures that the group cares for each other through life's milestones. So when, when something happens in someone's life, the DG should be the first people in that place. If it's a funeral, it's an accident, it's a hospitalization, it's your DG that should be there. And as DG members, we need to understand, this is my obligation, this is my family member, we care. Long before any pastor arrives, it's the DG members who should be in that place, uh, caring for, for each other. And as a leader, you make sure that people are caring for each other. Holds the group accountable to do evangelism and invite people to grow their group. As a DG leader, you should be distressed that your group is not growing. And you should be telling people, let's pray. Give me names of people you can invite. Let's pray for them and ensure that they're coming. Uh, the person is discipled by and connects regularly with their MC leader. We'll talk about their MC leader or Zono pastor and who those are. But they are being discipled. You can't disciple people and lead them uh, to where you're not being led. And so you need to also be an active disciple in order to be a discipler of others. And then attends the DG leader's trainings. And if they're training other apprentices, we'll bring them into those trainings because they also want to multiply themselves. When you're a DG leader, everybody you look at, like Jesus. Jesus had a DG of 12 people. And we just saw today that Jesus said to them, the things you've seen me do, you will do far greater things. Yeah. Jesus' intention was, all of you will do greater than me. And guess what? That's why Jesus was able to start a movement that even till today, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him. That's how you influence the world. My prayer for my disciples, these ones here, is that all of them will do far greater things than me. And I can see it already, by the way. Yeah, I can already see how they are going to do it. Because every one of them has such a particular gift in something that I could not even imagine. And I'm so proud of it. And I want to nurture and push them to make sure that they do those things. Challenge them to make sure they do those things. And then attend, ensures weekly attendance reports are sent to the MC leader. I need to make sure that I'm accountable to, because you're the accounting officer in your group. If you're not the one with the skill, then make sure your assistant has the skill to send the report. And there's a report that is given that talks about the attendance, everything that's happening in your DG. That's what you do. And that's a system we have. By the way, this, this is so liberating for me as a pastor. When this system works, my work is so easy. Because it distributes the work of discipleship to the whole congregation. Yeah, when you're the pastor of a large church and you're trying to be the, you're the main center of discipleship, you die. When you're the CEO of a large company and you're the one who's responsible for the vision of that company alone, you die. Yeah. If your workers are not disciples, you will constantly be hiring new people. And be great. And, people. Yeah. and what, what secu the secular world has found substitutes for discipleship through things like franchising. But a franchise model just actually gives you just standard operating procedures and tells you this is how you open the door. This is how you put the flowers out. This is the kind of spoons you have discipleship. Yeah, that's why when you walk into a McDonald's anywhere in the world, it's the same. Because they disciple. <laughs> yeah. So even secular people understand the power of what I'm talking about. You need, need, you need as a Christian to even have more authority because yours is a spiritual enterprise and it's underpinned spiritually. Number two, missional community. Missional community, MC, what we call an MC. What is the definition? An, a missional community is an extended family or two to five related DGs that impact their community together through shared mission activity. So two to five discipleship groups that are related and they have shared missional activity. They're led by an MC leader. And what is their purpose? The primary purpose is outreach. The primary purpose is outreach. The primary purpose of a discipleship group was what? Discipleship. Now this one, it's about outreach. To help their member DGs become effective in sharing the gospel and in reaching the less fortunate in society. MCs are large enough that they can mobilize resources and manpower that DGs would struggle to. 
Adiji is too small to manage some of the big needs of society. But an MC can marshal because there are four groups, two groups, three groups, you have more resources. But they are also small enough that they are flexible and efficient compared to a large congregation. A large congregation is too big. If all of us here decide to impact one children's home, we're never going to be able to do it. So an MC is, 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 is small enough to care, but it's large enough to have the resource. Yeah? So that's, that's, uh, that's what an MC does. What are the functions of an MC? They carry out their outreach role by forming that loving family of several DGs. Remember, family is always at the center of this thing. So they're ensuring that the DGs associate, they love each other, they're working together. And there's three things that they provide. Evangelism opportunities. As an MC leader, you're ensuring, you're holding your DGs, leaders accountable to growth. Ensuring that their members are regularly inviting others to DG out meetings and outreach events. They also coordinate a joint evangelistic event at least three times a year. We want the groups to also be able to do something big during the holiday months. And that's what the MC leader helps coordinate. Social justice opportunities. One of the things we've said is we want our discipleship groups to do something every month to look after the less fortunate. But the MC leader is the one who has the capacity then to help organize that. So that all three or four groups under their care are able to come once a month and go to that children's home, go to that police station, go to that place where they're impacting as their front line. And then number three is multiplication, encouraging the DG leaders to grow and multiply their groups, thus forming new groups and growing the MC to the place where new MCs can even be birthed. Because every stage of growth, every stage is a stage of multiplication. DGs should be multiplying DGs. MCs should be multiplying MCs. It's a higher level of influence. By the time you're a DG leader, you've got your seven people, you've got your 12 people. By the time you're an MC leader, you've got your 14 people, you've got your 50 people. You're now a leader of 50. And that's a very different level of influence. Ask your neighbor, how influential are you, by the way? Just remind me. <laughs> how many people are you actually influencing for the kingdom? If you're an MC leader, you've got an answer to that question. Because your influence is maybe even 50 people that you are influencing through that MC. Now, how are MCs formed? MCs are formed through campus pastors clustering several DGs in an area and appointing an MC leader. That's one of the inorganic ways. Maybe the pastor says there are several unrelated groups, but I want to put them together and put an MC leader in charge of them. And that's one of the ways, especially when you're starting and you didn't have that culture in your church. It's the easiest way to get started. But the way I really like, which is the organic way, is through an existing DG uh, uh, sorry, an uh, existing MC growing and multiplying to form two or more. So basically what's happening is the MC is multiplying DGs until they become too many to be managed and then they hive. They say to one of the leaders of the DGs, I want you to become the MC leader of that new group. And the MC now has given birth and influence has increased. Are you seeing what happens? So at every level, there's influence. If you're a DG member, your influence is through bringing people to DG. If you're a DG leader, it's through multiplying the DG. If you're an MC leader, it's through multiplying your MC. And guess what's happening at every stage? Influence is growing. More and more people are being influenced. More and more people are becoming followers of Jesus. What's the job description of an MC leader? I know this one is technical, by the way. It's different from anything else we've done. But I think you're prepared for technical, isn't it? I've given you enough inspiration and big reason, big picture. So today I wanted to get into the nitty-gritty. How do we actually create this influence? The job description of an MC leader, they disciple DG leaders, meet them monthly. So you need to make sure you're meeting your people. You can't disciple from a distance. Uh, I encourage MC leaders not to lead their own DG because that's too much responsibility. You need to make sure you have an assistant who then you make in charge of the DG. And then now you've, you, you oversee your four groups, which means that every week you can actually attend a different one. They're all your sons and daughters. So you should be able to go and visit a different one and see how they're doing and coach the person, encourage the person. So they disciple the DG leaders. Uh, try and get a, a group, a monthly thing together where you're able to at least, even if it's Zoom or it's coming together, you're able to, to encourage them. Visits a different group weekly to ensure that they're growing in faith and in ministry. And then organizes the monthly frontline missional engagement. It's your job to make sure my groups are actually impacting. They're getting those rewards of loving the poor of impacting the society. The MC leader also coaches and encourages the DGs under them to evangelize and multiply. Again, it's all about fruitfulness. I want my MC to become big and multiply. And then is discipled by and connects regularly with the zonal pastor as part of their leadership team. 
So you also have a discipler. As you're discipling your DG leaders, you're being discipled by your zonal pastor. They attend the regular MC leaders trainings along with their apprentices, and then they ensure a weekly MC report is sent out to the zonal pastor. Now, this is all translatable. It can be translated into any sector. But the church is the place where we train you to do this. This is the place where we start to train you how to have influence. It's your best leadership training school. I know you've never known this. You thought getting a degree in Harvard in leadership is what will make you a good leader. It wouldn't. This is practical hands-on leadership. You know something? Being a CEO is very easy. I'm a CEO of several companies. <laughs> I'm a chairman. <laughs> you know why it's easy? Because any of my employees who don't perform, what do I do? I fire them and do what? I replace them. That's, that's why I think I don't get impressed by CEOs. CEOs rule by, yeah, position. I can do it. I don't need to be a very nice person or charismatic or a good leader or a multiplier. I just need to be strategic and smart. And anybody who doesn't perform, I kick them out. You can't disciple by being a CEO. Discipleship calls for many more skills because you're discipling people you're not paying. They are following you because God has grown you as a leader. Yeah? Guys, can I say something very foolish? Forgive me for saying it. I'm not paying any of you to be here today. I'm not paying any of you to give up your Saturday. I've not paid the many of you who've been here the whole week for four days. But you're here. Why I'm saying it's foolish is I don't want to offend you. But isn't it the truth? You're here. So what does that tell you? It tells you that God has grown my kingdom influence. Because not anybody can call four, five hundred people to take four days out of their businesses where they should be earning money to be here. I'm using myself as an example just so that you can understand. That just having a good company doesn't do this. Yeah. If the CEO of Safaricom is just to come and say, I'm going to be here for four days and just talk. People ask, so what will you give us? Yeah. What's a per diem for me to come and leave my... Yeah. <laughs> what's the sitting allowance what's in it for me but you didn't ask that question isn't it what am I saying I'm saying God wants you to become an influential person and it has nothing to do with position he wants you to be influencing many 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 people Yeah, Jesus had 5,000 people there and he taught them many things and they left their homes and they followed him into the wilderness without food <laughs> and no plans for food they just followed that's influence. And then Jesus says, you will do greater things than this. So I'm just teaching you the pathway that God has given us in the church to train every single one of you for kingdom influence. The last one is a zone that I'm going to define. Of course, you've seen there's other levels up there. A zone. A zone is an extended family of two to five related missional communities that occupy a shared geographical location or region. That's what a zone is. So it's the MCs, but now the MCs are clustered. Just like the DGs were clustered to form an MC, the MCs are clustered to form a zone. It's led by a zonal pastor. And we have zonal pastors in many of our churches. Any zonal pastors in the house? Let me just see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some serious zonal pastors around here. We're talking about serious influence. You know, you're sitting next to that person. I told you, you get to heaven and you'll be surprised. Allah, I thought we were just sitting together in the gathering. Kumbe, you have some serious kingdom responsibility I didn't even know about. <laughs> the primary purpose of a zone is expansion. Taking territory. Expansion. So remember, DG, what was the purpose? Discipleship, MC, outreach. For a zone, is expansion. Taking kingdom territory. To help their member MCs become effective in multiplying themselves so that they're increasingly reaching more and more people in a wider scope of influence. Ultimately, the zone should be able to multiply and form other zones or plant more campuses. So again, even in a zone, you're always thinking, how do I grow my zone? How do I multiply this zone? How do I form another zone out of it? How do churches even come out of this zone? Now, how do, how do these functions play out? 
Uh, the zones play an important role in caring for members of the congregation, and this include, number one, coordinating discipleship. So a zonal pastor is the one who ensures that discipleship structures within the zone are working. People are being discipled. Leaders are being developed at all levels. So it's a bigger picture role. It's a much more demanding role, by the way, because they're the ones who are ensuring that all my DGs are healthy. All the groups are reporting. All the groups, is, we can see good things are happening. That's a role. Coordinating outreach activities within the zone. They may not be the ones doing the monthly outreach, but they are ensuring that there's coordination. So that if there's sharing of resources that is needed, they can help people and say, oh, by the way, these guys are doing exactly the same thing. So they coordinate all the MCs and the outreach they're doing. Coordinate training. You are going to realize zonal pastors do a lot of coordination. They coordinate training, ensuring that all DGs and MC leaders in the zone attend the training meetings and assisting their campus pastor in these meetings. Because that's the job of the campus pastor, to ensure that there's teaching and there's training. So as a zonal pastor, you're ensuring, yes, none of my people is being left behind. We are all there. We are being trained. And then ensuring that that training is going down uh, to all levels. Coordinating multiplication. Encouraging the DGs and MCs that are healthy and well positioned to grow and to multiply. So that's, that's another role of coordinating. And then creating a sense of family. Creating a sense of ownership and family along all the, the zone, including all the DGs and MCs. So I, I'm just giving you stuff. Some of you, for, for some of you, this is complete theory. Complete theory. It's like going to I'll, what, what, sine, cosine. What does this have to do with logarithm tables? It's like, what is this? How will this ever help me in life? But I'm giving it to you because one day it will. This is not log and cosine. By the way, does cosine help in life? Any mathematicians, please. How, how, how has it helped us? How, uh, cosines are deficient making matrix. You have even talked about matrix now. I, I'm getting a headache. I believe you. I believe you. Some of, it's how you're able to graduate, to calculate. Just come, come. I need a mathematician to explain. Somebody is about to be liberated. You thought you wasted your school fees. <laughs> Papa Kilo. Yeah, you're about... <laughs> okay. Yeah, how does, how does yeah, cosine... Yeah, so uh -huh. cosines help in... It's the decision. It's actually the foundation of the decision-making matrix. It's how you're able to... Um, for example, you're going somewhere. It's how you're able to make the decision to use Bangathi way or bypass because of traffic and all that. In life, when you wake up in the morning, it's how you're able to decide, okay, if, uh, it's how you're able to prioritize your tasks based on how long it's going to take for you to do the task. Wow. Wow. Now you know. I had someone saying, Google Maps? I thought that's what determines. <laughs> but to make Google Maps, you need to understand cosines. That's what she's saying. She's saying without cosines, we'd have no Google Maps. So, so now I know. I mean, now I feel much better about the school fees. <laughs> Actually, I was asking for a friend, and I knew the answer. <laughs> I, should, <laughs> I was asking for Pastor Milton here. Yeah, he, he, really, he was feeling a lot of pain about that cosine. <laughs> so I'm giving you, I'm telling you, this, this thing will help you, even if it feels like theory right now. Maybe you're a new Christian, you're not even in a DG yet, you're wondering, what is this theory? I'm giving you your pathway to greatness. This is the route you will use, how you'll calculate Bagadi Road until you get to where you're supposed to be going. In the kingdom of God, not in Nairobi, the, the city of Nairobi. How are zones formed? Zones are formed through campus pastors appointing a zonal pastor and clustering several DGs or MCs in an area under them. That's the inorganic way. When you're starting off, you don't have any zones. One of the things a campus pastor will do is figure out, I need several geographic areas. So I know, Pastor Mishu, when you started, you started with, where is he? Oh, there he is. You started with one zone. But you knew that you're going to multiply your zones. And you already knew the city is divided into north, south, east, west. And so already you are praying, I need a leader for west, for south, for east, center, for north. And so that was his thinking right from the beginning. Because he knew this church has to take the whole city. So he was already thinking, how do I get this? How do I get this? And as God gave him leaders, he began to appoint, hey, you're the zonal pastor for the, all the DGs in this area, as the DGs in that area were growing. So as a campus pastor, he could just actually just say, I've got five DGs, 10 DGs here. I want to form a zone. 
and I'm going to appoint a zonal shepherd or a zonal pastor to look after them. Or number two, the one I really like, is through an existing zone growing and multiplying to form another zone or to plant a church. Yeah, so uh, it multiplies and it forms a church. That's how Mavuno Raka was formed, isn't it? Yeah, because Pastor, Pastor um, Nyamu was actually a zonal pastor at Mavuno downtown. So the zone can grow to the place where it's like, okay, we can see an opportunity. We can even plant a church in that area. So that's how zones are formed. So job description, final thing, job description of a zone or pastor. Disciples, the MC leaders, meets them monthly, visits them to ensure they're growing in faith and in ministry. This thing is always about helping people become like Jesus. So it doesn't matter how high you are. You always have somebody who's helping you become like Jesus. So, for example, the executive pastors of this church, one of my first things, in fact, my first job description is to help them grow to become like Jesus. Yeah. I'm always on their case. I want them to become like Jesus. And it's not because I'm perfect, but I say, follow me as I'm following Christ. So I disciple them. I want their marriages to work. I want their finances to work. I want their Bible reading to work. I want them to be fruitful Christians. And so as a zonal pastor, you're doing that for your MC leaders. Uh, number two, organizes seasonal fun days. So three, every, every, three times a year, there's an outreach fun day that helps form a sense of family and community and also is used for outreach as well. So every April, August, December, whatever, the, whatever calendar we're running with, uh, I know that works for many of our African countries. It's different when we're in other parts of the world. But there's seasonal fun days, which are outreach days. And they're the ones who coordinate because then you get a whole zone together and you can do something really, uh, really fun. Helps the campus pastor to organize regular MC leader trainings and coaches the MCs and the DGs under them to multiply. He's disciple by and connects regularly with the campus pastor as part of the campus leadership team. So what I do with Pastor Kilonzi, I expect him to do with his zonal pastors. Those are his primary disciples in the church. And then fills out and sends out a weekly zonal report that captures all the reports that were sent to the MC leaders who sent to the zonal pastors. And then send, he sends or she sends that to the campus pastor. And that's how we, we make sure that everybody in the church is cared for. This is how we make sure that everybody is growing, that there are no fallouts, that if there's a funeral, the campus pastor knows. If there's a crisis, the pastor, campus pastor is informed. And then assist campus pastor in other ministry duties to care for the congregation. So, by the time you're a zonal pastor, you have a lot of people under you. Because remember, HMC had maybe 50. And now you have four such groups. So you are a leader of 200. 250. Your influence has grown. And all these people are following you as you follow Jesus. You may not have an individual relationship with each of them, but you're the one who is setting the temperature and helping them grow to become more like Jesus. Please ask the other neighbor again for me, just graciously. Like, how many people are you influencing? Like, 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 are you an influential person? I thought you told me you're influential. Because at the beginning they said they're influential, but now it's like, are you sure you're influential? Yeah. You may have thought you're influential, but maybe you have a different perspective right now. <laughs> so I'm going to be, I want to pray for, I want to pray for um, some of those influential leaders in our, net, in our movement and celebrate them for a second. But before I do that, I want to actually maybe just very quickly talk about the rhythms. This, I'm actually giving you a training that a campus pastor would typically give. When, when he has his leaders night or when he's training his leaders uh, or, as, or, or a network pastor. This is the kind of thing that you will be taught. Uh, what, are DG, what, are, what, what are the discipleship group rhythms? The discipleship rhythms in our church. Number one is daily. As a DG leader, you're looking at daily. What are the daily rhythms I want everybody to carry, to have as they're growing to become like Christ? The first one is Bible reading. I want to make sure everybody in my group is reading the Bible. This thing of reading the Bible through the year I'm not going to check whether Pastor Jackie or Pastor Geneva is reading the Bible through the year. It's not, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to check, by the way. I know you do. But you see, I can't verify. But Pastor Godi, uh -uh, he better be reading the Bible through the year. Because I want him to develop that discipline of hearing God's voice. And I make sure my whole discipleship group that they're reading and we're reporting it in the Bible app. So they can tell you, on Fridays, usually I put my little post of caught up. It has like a thing of, on track 
And I always put that. And they only, I don't even have to ask. They know the implication is, I want to see all of yours. And, and, and that's, I, I'm making sure they're reading the word. And that I can tell when somebody's falling behind and I can start asking what's happening in your life. Because it shows me there's a lack of balance in your life if you're always falling behind in reading scripture. Um, f- um, huh? What did you do to Oh, daily. Uh, 4.30 p.m. prayers. A- oh, a.m. Sorry, 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 sorry. Hey. But, you know, two years ago, people would have said, hey, 4.30 p.m., the pastor's announced. Now they're the ones telling me, ah, it's a.m., Bana. <laughs> I love you, Mabuna. It's, okay, there's discipleship in the house, I tell you. <laughs> people are an army here. 4.30 a.m. prayers. I want to make sure all my disciples are attending those prayers. That's a daily rhythm, guys. Jesus read the word. He, he, every, before, it was dawn, before it was dark, uh, before it was light, he would go out to a place by himself and seek God. I want to make sure we are all seeking God in our DG and that we are all reading the word. Weekly, I want to make sure that we are attending family night. Mine is easy because me, I just tell them, come to my house. We are going to be the ones in family nights. <laughs> For yours, it should be your DG. You know, are you, I, I need to make sure everybody's here. We are watching it together or we are watching it after. So that's, that's a rhythm because it's how we make sure we have a discipleship conversation every week. Let me tell you guys something that you may not know. We typically do family night from 5.30 to 6.30, right? Do you know what time these guys leave my house? Generally around 11 p.m. And it's because I chase them. If I let these guys, they will sleep the whole night there. And it's because we have so much fun. And usually we say the best part of DG is after family night. Because now we start just talking. Sometimes it's a topic that has nothing to do with family night. And we just start talking and it becomes a place of just discipleship. How are you following the Lord in this area? And we just have having a conversation. Sometimes it's about something very random. has nothing to do with anything spiritual. But somehow God just brings it to a place where all of us begin to grow. It, bu- it builds our love for each other. And every time we do it, I just feel like our hearts get more and more connected. So that DG attendance, it's not just a legalistic thing. It's a way that we grow our family. Uh, our, and that's, it happens together, the weekly rhythm. Month, this... Serving in church, that's a weekly rhythm. Asking, thank you, Pastor Kilonzi. Serving in church. I want to make sure, again, it's easy for me because they're all pastors. If they miss church, I will hear about it. <laughs> but yeah, are your disciples serving in church? You want to make sure everybody has a place of service and that they're also adding value to the kingdom of God. And so that's what you do. That's a rhythm. Uh, monthly, we have an outreach event as a group. Even if it means we cancel our DG meeting that, month, that, that week, that's okay. The most important thing is that we are impacting the world together somehow. And we do it as an MC, uh, several DGs together. If we're just a DG, not an MC, then we do it as a DG. So that's our monthly outreach event. And then if you're, for, for, if you're on a campus, the leader's night is one of the things that, for Pastor Kilonzi, when do you guys, in, in first Friday, they do their leader's night. So he gets all the leaders in the church, and they just have a teaching time. So that's another rhythm that is an, a, a, a monthly rhythm. Seasonally. Seasonally means every season, every four months. And it's what we call the Zono Fun Day. Zono Fun Day is a great time to have a barbecue, have a fun a, a game day or do something. Do a hike. Invite your friends who are not in the DGs. And it's just a place for outreach but also for fun together. Building our Zono family. And then annually, you're in one of them. Because the gatherings are annual rhythms, isn't it? So again, it's being able to say, hey, are we planning ahead for our gatherings? Are we, ha- are we planning ahead for fearless? Are we planning to be together and to be instructed by God's word? So those are some of the rhythms. As your DG leader, you're thinking, I want to make sure that my people are growing by being part of these things. And it's not just being part. Like now when, you, when they come, you have a chance to have a conversation. I've talked with people here who I know, as I preached one thing, as we were talking about one thing, they had a conversation with themselves where they're saying, I need to go and talk to this couple in my DG because I can see that's an issue for them. And I want to go and say, what did you hear Pastor M say? How does it apply? A DG leader is always thinking, how does this apply to help my people grow to become more and more like Jesus? Have I helped somebody? So all of you now understand the nitty-gritty of how you grow your kingdom influence. And by the way, as you do this, you're, 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 you're increasing because you started with just yourself. Then you became 10 people. Now you're influencing 10 people. Then you went to a place now where you're influencing 50 people. Now you've reached a place where you're influencing uh, 250 people. And all that is just happening. It's not you doing all the work. It's raising disciples who are raising disciples. And everybody is carrying the weight. So your job is to help the leaders as they lead. 
Now, let me just tell you, this is worth the price of the gathering, which was free, but it's worth the price of your time here. Just If you just understood this and could break it down into any segment, any sector, any role, you'll be amazed to find out you can actually change a country's parliament using what I've just taught you. Yeah. You could change the judiciary. You could change your industry. You could change your company. You could change your street or your estate just by following a very simple process of raising, making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. I think Jesus is the most genius leader I've ever thought, I've ever heard of. I've read so many leadership books in my life, but nothing beats this. This is the most incredible thing. Go and make disciples of all nations. This is how you end up changing civilizations. And that's what Jesus did, just by understanding a very simple process. And he spent time with those disciples. He shaped their lives and their thinking, and he helped them shape the lives and thinking of the people who came after them, and so on and so forth, until 2,000 years later, here we are. Tell your neighbor, here you are. <laughs> so let me just start by asking all our network pastors to stand up, all our executive pastors. So those are our executive pastors uh, who are here. Some are, some are outside or doing other things. But um, Pastor Milton, Mashariki Network, Pastor Zedi, uh, uh, Pastor Mr. Milton and Vivian, uh, Pastor Zedi and Victor, uh, South Network, Pastor Kevin and Faith, uh, Downtown Network, Pastor Godwin and Noel, Lifeway Network, Pastor James and Dorcas, Hill City Network, right? Here's Pastor James. Those are your, come, come up, come up and stand up here. So those are your leaders. Now, by the way, the influence these people have is not small influence. Even though they are young, because they're not old people, except me and Pastor Milton. <laughs> they're, not, they're young people, by the way. And remember, our souls are very young, by the way. So we're all infants here. We're very young. But these guys influence many people in many nations. Yeah. They're influencing people in nations who are doing what they do. Yeah. When I go to Mavuno Kisumu, I find people who think like Papa Jimmy. Yeah. It's amazing. And yet some of them I've never met him personally. But there's a way they think because they think like Carol and Ishmael or Gweno who are discipled by Pastor James. So Pastor James has influence in a city that is 500 kilometers away. Hey, ask your neighbor again. Like, as you said, you have how much influence? That's influence. That's influence. Isn't it? Yeah. That's influence. And that's the same for each of these who are standing here. Now, let me invite the campus pastors. No, no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Not campus pastors. Let me invite the campus pastors who are leading a cluster. Because it's, it's kind of like a technical term we're coming up with. But it's campus pastors who are influencing other campus pastors, leading other campus pastors. So Pastor Mike Onen and Osai. Yeah, yeah. So, Pastor Mike, I, I mentioned earlier, in the absence, they actually are influencing five different campuses. And they're discipling the campus pastors of those campuses. They're under Pastor Kilonzi, but they're influencing now. They're, they've been delegated the leadership of those campuses. Pastor Kelvin, Kelvin and Charity. Hey, I stand next to your man. Uh, <laughs> and they're influencing uh, three campuses. You, you want to? Oh. Three campuses. <laughs> for now. Unaskia. He says three campuses for now. Uh, that's that's the, 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 the Kelvins, the Mugambis. And then Pastor Nyamu and Joe. And you guys are influencing how many campuses? Four campuses. Yeah, including theirs, all of them. But they're influencing those campuses. And then Pastor David Courier and Joanne Courier. I think they're the ones who paid some people in the house. And you're influencing how many, how many campuses? Three campuses. So, again, that's a serious level of influence, isn't it? And they're influencing people. There are some 
people in this church who think, talk, make noise like Pastor Joan Kuria. Yeah, we know them. Huh? We know them. And we know who their influencer is. Because Pastor Joan Kuria has significant influence. Yeah, she has influence. Kingdom-wise, she has serious influence. There are some noisemakers in this house who just resemble their mother, Pastor Nyamu. <laughs> yeah. By the way, she doesn't pay them. But they just talk like her. And they just make noise like her. Yeah. That is significant influence, my friends. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? I'm hoping that you're beginning to see when it comes to the kingdom, influence is not about even money. Yeah, money follows you. Yeah, money will follow them as they do their work. But right now what they're growing is their kingdom influence. Let me ask the campus pastors to stand. Pastor, campus pastors. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all around the room. Hey, they are becoming many. Praise God. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. So, I can't even introduce them because they are many, but they are amazing leaders. They are amazing leaders. And each of these, God has given a level of influence in the area that they are in. God has given them responsibility of our city, of our neighborhood, of our region. And each of them, God is using them to change the lives of people. Yeah. And soon all of them are going to become cluster leaders and then network leaders. Yeah. Because they want their influence to grow. And the people they are discipling will also start. I mean, Pastor Ray, you, you never saw yourself as a campus pastor. But now I'm afraid of anybody you disciple. Because even you, they will actually become, you will also see in them what somebody saw in you, right? Yeah. So anybody who serves under him will, will also become great like him. Yeah. That's just the way it is. So all these are influential people. Now, I want you to understand, I mean, th this, is, this is just a level of leadership that is influencing in the kingdom. And lives are at stake. They're, they're actually leading people's lives. Can you see how many there are, by the way? There are many more than you thought. All right, let me ask uh, the Zono pastors to stand and join those ones. Any Zono pastors in the house? What? Praise God. Look at that. They're dressed in all the colors of the rainbow. <laughs> now, these are, these are serious influencers. They are, they, are, they are playing at a very high level of impact as well. Are you seeing how it happens in the kingdom? You're sitting next to someone and you're like, Allah, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> like, seriously? I didn't know you have this kind of influence. All right, let me ask the MC leaders, missional community leaders, if they're here. Just stand up to your feet as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're standing, they're standing, they're standing. Yeah. Those are our missional community leaders. What were you guys doing sitting? You forgot your part. <laughs> yeah. All these are disciples. And they're disciples of multiple people. Multiple groups. Let me invite the discipleship group leaders. The DG leaders. What? What? <laughs> wow. Now, if this was an army, if this was an army, you've just seen the officers stand. You've just seen the officers of the army stand. And they're the ones, they're influencing the lives of many, many, many people. Guys, I want to say I'm so proud of every single one of you. I'm so proud of every single one of you. You're changing lives. Allah, most of my deacons and past and elders. Eh, eh. <laughs> I tell you, you are changing lives, people. And I'm so proud of you at whatever level you are. And listen, aspire for greatness. Aspire for greatness. You have not arrived. God wants you to influence many more people than you're influencing right now. But I bless God that you, took, you, you stopped looking down on yourself. You stopped saying, I'm not qualified. Uh -uh. Who else will do it if not you? And I'm grateful for all the lives that are being changed because of every single one of you. Never underestimate the eternal impact. Never underestimate the eternal impact. What you're doing is not an administrative task. Administration might have a part to do with it, but it's not administrative primarily. It's a spiritual task. You're living in obedience to the Great Commission. You are impacting that rope called eternity. Yeah. 
Not just for yourself, but for many, 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 many people. And that's what Jesus desired for you to do. And I want to speak over you. You will do greater things than Jesus did. In fact, let's even move from Jesus because me, I will do greater things than Jesus did. So you will do greater things than me. Yeah, all of you, than Pastor Caro and myself, you will do them. You will do them. And this world will be changed because of you. Yeah, villages will be changed. Cities will be changed. Nations will be changed. Continents will be changed because of these men and women. Now, that blessing is not just for them. Let me invite anybody who is in a discipleship group to stand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because you're in that space where you're about to enter and join the commissioned ranks of officers in this army. Yeah, the people who will rule nations. My God, look at that. There are so many of you. Praise Jesus. Wow, 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 wow. I bless God for you. I bless God that you've entered the journey of discipleship. That you're being trained to be able to train others. You're being discipled to be able to disciple others. You're being influenced to be able to influence others. Today I pray that the Lord has given you a revelation of why it's important for you to aspire for greatness. To aspire to disciple others. To aspire to serve. Remember what we said at the very beginning. It's so important you don't get it twisted. This thing is never about dominance. It's about service. The greatest among you will be the one who serves the most people. The one who washes the most feet. The one who cares for the most people. That's what Jesus is calling you to be. And my prayer for all of you who've just joined them is you will lead your own disciples. Yeah. You will influence your own people. You will influence them. Yes. Yes. Now, because this is the house of God, nobody can remain sitting all the time. The rest of you stand up because you're going to join a discipleship group. Yes. Can we just clap for them as well? <laughs> Amen. For the first time you've understood that this discipleship group thing is not about just being in a Bible study. It's not just about wasting your Wednesday night. It's not just about sitting down with Christians, swapping Christian stories. This is being equipped for influence of nations. And my prayer is that none of you will leave this gathering without signing up. Ah, make today the last day you're not part of a DG. The last week you're not part of a DG. At the, at the, bottom, at the, at the end there, they'll have a sign-up sheet. Just sign up. For those of you who stood up, sign up. Put your name. Put your location, uh, whichever campus you're part of. If you're not in a campus, you can tell us. And then, uh, we'll be ha and then your contacts. And we'll be happy to connect you with a discipleship group. So you can start your journey of influence. God's people, I want to challenge you. Aspire for great things for the kingdom. Aspire for greatness in the kingdom. Aspire not to be mediocre in the kingdom of God. Aspire not to be one of those people who has no crowns and no rulership in the kingdom of God. Aspire to be the greatest among you. And the greatest among you is the one who serves. Ah, aspire that many people will be blessed because you're there. Yeah. You know, because of me, all these ones here, their lives are going to be much better than they would have been. All of them. Because all of them, will. it's my job to make sure they exceed me and Pastor Caro in greatness. Yeah. And guess what? Because it's their job to ensure you, that you exceed them, imagine the level of greatness by the time it gets to you. Yeah, because that's our job. If we don't do that, we fail. I'm not here to dominate them. I'm here to make them greater than me. My job is to wash their feet. I've come to understand. I've even told them. My biggest job is to serve them. The reason I don't even run a campus now is because I realize I can't. And I can't lead a network. I need to lead these ones and care for them. And they are supposed to also care for the ones behind them and ensure they become greater than them. And if all of us do our job well, oh my goodness, by the time it reaches the ones who just stood up now, you will be so far. You will be so amazing. You will be influencing at such a high level. Yeah. People will be changed because of you. People will be changed. I want to just say, in the next few years, you will have international disciples. Yeah. Yeah. You will have sent people out of the country and they will be following Jesus because of you. Oh my goodness. Imagine you've learned wisdom today that is going to change the world. Yeah. That business you're running is not just a business. It is an, a seed of the kingdom to change your whole industry. And it will happen because you've understood now how to do it. Yeah. We change people who change people who change people and we change the world.